and, and more wanting to protect the, our de democratic system by being a little bit more a a apolitical, uh, Madam Speaker. Uh, foreign interference is something that's completely unacceptable. The Honourable Member of Sandwich Gulf Islands. This evening on uh, the adjournment proceedings, there are always, there's always that sense, because most of what I want to say about the climate science is that we're running out of time and the hour is late. Well, both of those things are literally true as I rise to speak after midnight. I'm raising a question that I put to the Prime Minister on March 22nd of this year uh, in question period in response to the most recent and sobering report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is a large institution created by the World Meteorological Organization, the United Nations Environment Program, and it's not too much to make the claim and a proud claim that Canada had a lot to do with setting up the IPCC back in 1988. But the reports from the IPCC, although we talk about the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change a lot, they actually do painstaking work that takes years. So this is the sixth assessment report that came out with its final volume on March 23rd of this year. We will not see another major review of the science from this eminent scientific body created by governments that appoint the scientists. It's a massive peer review process. We won't see another report till sometime after 2030. So the receipt of this document, the warnings in it could not be more urgent. And as many said when the report was tabled, this is really the last report when we have a chance to make a difference. Because what the IPCC says very clearly is that global greenhouse gas emissions must be arrested and begin to fall rapidly before, and this is important, before 2025. So while the government has a, a, a target that's, that, that they describe as ambitious, what it does is the target the government chose of net zero by 2050 is out of sync with the science, out of time with the reality that in order to control and avoid runaway global warming, we need to act now. Now, when I asked the question March 23rd, Canada wasn't on fire. We'd lived through a lot of extreme weather events across Canada, whether Hurricane Fiona or the wildfire seasons that have plagued British Columbia year after year, or the heat dome over four days in 2021, late June to July 1st in British Columbia, in which two, 619 people died. We have gone through fires and floods and extreme weather events, and yet we are still here talking about when we will get serious about climate action. So the answer I had from the Prime Minister was to, to talk about the cr concrete actions the government has taken. As ever, the Prime Minister or his Minister of Environment talk about monies committed. Now, some of that money has been committed to things that won't address the climate crisis, that may in fact worsen it, that are disguised subsidies to fossil fuels like carbon capture and storage. But the closing line from the Prime Minister was that the Minister of Environment and Climate Change has said this week, quote, we will be looking very closely at that report, close quote. Well, if you look at the report, not even closely, if you make a cursory review of that report, you know that we haven't done enough to avoid exceeding 1.5 degrees, shooting right past 2 degrees, and putting human civilization at risk within the next half century. We need to do more, and we need to do it now. And that's why I'm back here tonight. Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Health and to the Minister of Sports. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and thank you for, for being here we, into the wee hours of the, of the evening and into the morning uh, with us this evening. And I'd like to thank my friend and, and colleague from Saanich Gulf Islands for uh, her question this evening, um, but not just for that, for her decades of service, her leadership, for, for being an incredible steward, for being uh, an incredible spokesperson, uh, for being a voice of reason in this House, for being an extraordinarily knowledgeable parliamentarian, and for being a great friend 
Uh, thank you very much to the member for, for engaging in, in debate this evening. Um, Madam Speaker, moving on to the substantive question, uh, indeed our government since 2015 has, as the member pointed out, invested a lot of money in climate action. We can be proud of this collectively. We got elected on promises three times to take strong climate action and since 2015 over $120 billion has been invested in over 100 various measures. Uh, to support climate action and to address the climate emergency that we are all experiencing. Highlighted today by, you know, I will say many members in this House had noticeable differences in their voices and I can't help but wonder if that's a result of the smoke outside because of the nearby forest fires, um, which, you know, aren't even really that nearby. Uh, they're just so big that the smoke has arrived here in Ottawa and I saw some uh, some social media posts from people who have lived in Ottawa a lot longer than I've spent time in Ottawa over 50 years saying they've never seen the skyline like they have today. And it's really, really tragic that we find ourselves here. So we must continue to take bold action and be leaders on this, uh, on this issue for, for the world and for other countries to take note. We have a lot of common ground uh, in this House. There is quite a lot. I would say the vast majority of this House believes in climate change, believes it's an emergency and believes we must take action. Um, you know, it's still alarming to hear members, and I did today hear members say things like it's weather, it's normal, there's always been climate change. It's challenging, to be honest, to be in this place, to be a progressive politician, to care so much about climate action and recognize that there are some of these very antiquated views that are persistent, uh, and I would say primarily in the Conservative Party because I've never heard a member from another party in this House uh, falsely describe climate change as weather. Um, we agree oil and gas emissions must come down. In order to do that, we must introduce a cap on those emissions for the industry and for the sector. Um, we've also taken action on the consumer side. It's well known, it's extremely well documented that pricing carbon, pricing pollution does result in lower emissions in the long run. It's shocking that we spend so much time debating in this House whether or not a price on pollution is effective, given that 338 members of this House, every single Conservative, NDP, Bloc Québécois, Liberal and Green member campaigned on a promise to price carbon, and yet we find ourselves in 2023 debating the veracity and the legitimacy of a price on pollution. On this side of the House, and this side of the House, including the Green side of the House, we agree that pricing pollution is one of the many ways that we can uh, fight climate change, but we know that there, there's more that we must do. We've got a bold price on pollution, but we've also got to take more environmental action, more climate mitigation, as well as adaptation strategies. I can see that uh, I'm nearing the end of my speech and I have time for a follow-up, Madam Speaker, so I'll pass it over back to the member from Saanich Gulf Islands. The member from Saanich Gulf Islands. This is a really worthwhile discussion that the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary and I are having. Here's the problem for the answer the Prime Minister gives or anybody standing up for the Liberal Party. is It's not good enough if we're going to put the planet and continue the trajectory we're on, which threatens the survival. Not, this, is not, this is not hyperbole. It threatens the survival of human civilization. And we have a window in which to ensure we avoid going past 1.5 degrees, way past 2 degrees to 3 degrees, to unstoppable, self-accelerating, runaway global warming. That's what we're trying to avoid. We can't avoid the weather we're having now. We'll continue to have very unpleasant extreme weather events. The goal is to hang on to human civilization and arrest the climate crisis so our kids can survive, and Liberal policies don't do that. Um, uh, Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. You know, in fact, I'd go a step further in saying my goal isn't just so that my children, knock on wood, I don't have any yet, I would like to one day, can survive. My goal in this House of Commons, and one of the main reasons I put my name on a ballot, and I know they share this with many, many of my colleagues in this House, regardless of party stripe, is so that my future children thrive in this world. It's not enough to have a planet that is survivable. This planet needs to be one that allows our, our <laughs> the species of humans to thrive. And in order to do that, we need an ambitious and achievable plan. I'm confident that we're on the right track, but Madam Speaker, I know that the member uh, 
down the way uh, shares an admiration for Jean Chrétien. And when he says, you know, you, if the conservatives are telling that you're being too socialist and the socialists are telling that you're being too conservative, you might be getting it right. I don't want to suggest that we have to strike a balance on climate action, Madam Speaker, but we need to be an example for the world, an example for economies around the world. When you invest in green technologies, when you invest in your future and grow your economy, you can fight climate change and fight. Our member for Stormont Dundas, South Glengarry. Madam Speaker, we are in a housing crisis in this country, plain and simple, and the key figures demonstrate exactly that. Housing prices in this country have doubled to over $700,000. More 